Hey, what's up world and welcome to the 41st edition of the Take One Podcast, which is also the third edition of the Wrestling Corner. And um, yeah, so this episode I'm going to be, in a sense, recapping what happened this past Sunday at WWE No Mercy, which is a Raw brand pay-per-view. And... I'm going to give it my overall score after I'm done with it. Like, much like how I do the good and bad of Raw and SmackDown every, well, uh, the past two weeks and stuff. So, uh, that's basically how things are going to go. Um, yeah, before I even start all this stuff, uh, I know I've been, I've been taking a little break. A little bit break this week. I'm um, putting out stuff a little bit later. But I needed a break. I've been putting out stuff nonstop. This week, I told myself to kind of relax, try and get some sleep, and just prepare for next week. Because, like I've said before, I'm going to do my rebrand, and I want to start it at the first of the month. So, this Sunday will be the official rebranding of my channel. And uh, I have a lot of more stuff to do. Um, Well, you know, a lot more stuff to do. I have a lot more stuff to give out. But, in any case... Um, more on that on the next podcast, the uh, 42nd. But as of right now, um, I usually try to strive for, ever since I started getting my uh, channel back active, I'm trying to start, kind of strive for like 20 to 30 minute podcast every time I do a podcast, whether it's um, just a regular take one podcast or it's the wrestling corner edition of it. This one may go a little bit over it may go i'm giving my time frame to 30 to 40 minutes at least you know 10 minutes over 30 so i mean however long it goes it goes but i'm going to basically give the my thoughts on it and all that stuff i uh ended up watching the pay-per-view late because i had other stuff to do so but in any case let's get right into it um so we started off I'm not even going to get into the kickoff because, honestly, I didn't even watch the kickoff. I don't even know why they have kickoffs nowadays. Because for the simple fact that uh, last time we had a kickoff, I think it was SummerSlam, Miz was in the kickoff defending his Intercontinental Championship. And at that time, people were still coming in. Now, I get, you know... You know, you want people to have, you know, that's already there early and stuff like that to get some type of taste before, you know, the actual events start. But at the same time, it's like, yo, these seats are still filling up. Not really. Majority of the people that should be watching it like they will watch it on like the regular event when it when it actually officially starts. They're not going to be watching it because people are still coming in. People are still out there. They're not, you know, watching this match and stuff like that. So, it's like, I don't understand why they have pre-shows. If you're going to have a pre-show, do it with, like, unknowns. Do it with people who are not the Miz. Who are not a, a freaking Elias. You know, do it with people that's not a John Cena. Or, I mean, John Cena, of course, is never going to be in the kickoff. Uh, well, I mean, I, I mean, he never say never, but especially now, since he's going to be, since he's part time, he damn sure is not going to be there because they're going to want to basically make a big event out of every single time he comes back. So, but, you know, you get what I mean. Like, to give a, a spot like that to the, you know, um, uh, what is it? The pre-show to someone named someone like a Finn Balor or uh, a Bray Wyatt or something like that. It's just it's kind of disrespectful in a sense. I think they should do away with it or just do it with like lesser known names. Maybe do it to the cruiserweights that you know uh, a lot of people don't know. You know, and just do it like that. But in any case, um, I heard uh, Elias won. Uh, I think he was going against like a. Apollo Crews. I really didn't care, really at all. I really didn't care to watch that. But um, moving on to the actual first match of the night, which was the Miz defending his IC Championship, his Intercontinental Championship, against Jason Jordan. And this match was actually a pretty good match. I uh, I liked it. Um, the Miz ended up capitalizing off of the interference from the Miz to Raj. And uh, he wins. And after after that, you know, um, Jason Jordan was approached and asked him, how does he feel about this? And it, it's the promo, 
he needs he needs a lot of help on the mic. He he has he needs a lot of help developing mic skills because this guy he just I want to feel his pain. I want to feel his anger. I want to feel his sadness. Whatever he's delivering, I want to feel it. But overall, he's just not there. I mean, he may be a good um, ring performer, but when it comes to you know just getting on the mic and actually just saying something worthwhile or something funny or something just entertaining to everybody, to the WWE universe, to you, to me, and blah blah, blah. It, it's just it's he 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 lacks on it so so much. And I'm I'm pretty sure that Kurt Angle was working with him maybe in the back or I mean I, this is just my guess. You would think that since they're working kind of like a story together, you would think that you know they don't have to freaking drive everywhere because they're not tag team partners. But still, in the same sense, you would think that behind the scenes, I mean like really behind the scenes, that Kurt Angle was probably giving him tips on what he should do, what he should not do, how he should do. Just it, it just it seems like. I mean, right now, he just needs to talk less. He needs to do what they should do with Roman and what they kind of, well, not kind of, well, what they should do with Roman. Roman ain't that great on Mike, but they just kind of need to, like, chill him back. Give him a line or two or, you know, a few lines and stuff. Don't give him a whole paragraph to remember, you know. And it's just the same thing with Jason Jordan. Just give him a little bit to say, let him go in the ring, tear down, and then leave. That's it. That's all they need to do. But I think they're working the angle to where he's going to turn heel. But in any case, that was the match. Uh, the next match was Bray Wyatt versus Finn Balor. And in the match, you know, um, Finn Balor ends up getting attacked by Bray and taken out to where, you know, you always you almost think that he was going to, you know, the match wasn't even going to happen until Bray grabbed the microphone. And that basically was at the point where we like, okay, well, this match is going to continue because he's going to fire Finn up and then Finn going to, you know, go back in the ring and this match is going to be had. But the thing is that I didn't like about it was that it was predictable in that sense. But why in the hell... Would you beat down your opponent? Beat down your opponent. And as he's walking away, taunt him. I get, you know, you want to make, you know, you want to do it. I mean, you're a heel. But in the same sense, why would you taunt him? Especially when you see him turn around and he's angry, this and that. You're, it, it basically, it, it, it didn't come out to where it's like he was taunting him. You know, just to, you know, mock him, you know, not even mock him, but taunt him and all this stuff and just talk about him and all that. You know, he's not going to compete. It was, he was doing it in a sense to rile him up to get him to come back. Now, I mean, and that's just basically how I perceived it. It's like, why would you grab the mic and talk crap? Like, I would do it after he left. I would do it, like, backstage. I mean, I know this is all a storyline, but still, I mean, when you're doing storylines, you need to kind of... You know, make stuff make sense. And that didn't make sense for him to grab the mic and do that when you know specifically he's a tough motherfucker and he's going to want to come back and basically kick your ass, you know. And it's just, I didn't get that. You beat him down, but then you encourage him to be strong and fight. But in any case, Finn comes back and um, he wins with his finisher, of course. It wasn't no... um quick roll up or anything he did the uh coup de grace and he wins against uh Ray Wyatt which I believe I thought this was like the third match I think maybe it's the second match that they had together maybe I, I'm not entirely sure I maybe have to like go check or something but in any case I, I really don't care too much to do that but I mean it was a it was a pretty cool match it was a pretty cool match it was just, I didn't like how it began. I just didn't like that. Uh, going on to the next match is uh, Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins versus Sheamus and Cesaro. Now, one thing that came out of this, since it's, a, you know, some days later, is a lot of people were talking about Cesaro's teeth. Now, there was a spot where I believe it was Dean Ambrose or Seth Rollins. It was one of them. They basically... 
uh, flip him up into the turnbuckle. And instead of hitting the turnbuckle, he, I guess, I don't know. Like when you're when you're doing these moves, of course you're helping the move be performed. Because a lot of these moves, if you were just there, way more than likely couldn't be performed in a certain type of way that you know it is seen. So uh, he throws himself a little bit further than what I think he wanted to, and hits his hits his mouth up against the metal pole behind the turnbuckle. And he gets down, he turns around, kind of holds his hands to his mouth and drops to his knees. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of blood and it seems like he's lost teeth. I'm not sure, but I've heard that he didn't lose teeth. They got pushed up. Whether or not, I mean, just losing teeth in that type of way is hard enough. It's bad enough to get cracked teeth, lost teeth, whatever happened. It's bad enough, especially with all that blood. But to do that and get your teeth pushed up in your gums, that is something, that's a whole totally different type of monster. And the other notable thing to come out of this match is that not only did that happen, but he literally finished the match, didn't win, but finished the match. And this happened not in the middle of the match, not towards the end, but fairly relatively around the beginning of the match. And I want to say this match, maybe I want to say maybe about 10 minutes. So he went the rest of the match basically hurting his mouth is just bleeding and all this stuff he got the just this bad dental work thing going on and he actually went through and finished the match like that just shows how tough this son of a bitch is like i'm literally sitting here that's my other phone i'm sorry but i'm literally sitting here just thinking like man this is nuts like and it, it bring me back to the seth rollins uh John Cena thing where Seth Rollins did his what na what now is his finisher. Uh he did it to John Cena and I guess like misjudged how close he was and hit his knee up against John Cena nose which broke it. And that's basically what it kind of seemed like. Well, that's so crazy cuz when you think about that stuff, it's like Seth Rollins, he's just surrounded by injuries. I mean, not even just injuring him, not even just getting injured himself, but damn. So he's injured Finn Balor with the um, turn with the buckle bomb, which wasn't on a buckle. I think that was just on the outside. Before that, he injured Sting, and basically ended ended his career. He injured John Cena, and then in this match. Like, I'm not sure if he was the one who swung Cesaro, but like I said, Cesaro, he, like the other wrestler uh, is just, I ain't gonna say as responsible, but they help certain moves get performed so that they can look good. But in, in a sense, I don't know, I forgot whether it was Dean or Seth who did that. Basically was doing the move on him, but Seth is in the match. So literally he's around it. So there's there's four instances that could come to mind where people got injured not and i'm not even counting himself i'm not even counting seth rollins himself but you know you have finn balor sting john cena and now cesaro it's just i can't it can't be a predict i mean it can't be a coincidence it has to be some type of like bad luck that's surrounded around freaking seth rollins or well, Seth freaking Rollins, as he calls himself, as he burns it down. Uh, but in any case, um, so yeah. And one of the um, high spots of the match is that I love what they did uh, with Sheamus and Cesaro, which they picked uh, Cesaro had uh, Dean Ambrose up for the white noise, and then um, Cesaro had what did I say? Cesaro, Cesaro? Sheamus has. Uh, Dean Ambrose for the you know um, for the white noise. Then you have Cesaro has 
Seth Rollins up for a powerbomb off the turnbuckle. Once Sheamus drops Dean Ambrose with the white noise, Sheamus comes off the top rope or, you know, the top of the turnbuckle with Seth Rollins in the power bomb and power bombs him on Dean Ambrose. And I just love that spot. That was actually a pretty cool spot. But in all of that, uh, it comes to it to where they didn't win. <laughs> uh, they, they, I love Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins' finisher. I love it. But basically... Uh, one of the spots that I did like, this is at the end, that I did like was that when uh, freaking Sheamus, I believe he was about to bro kick Dean Ambrose, Dean Ambrose just fell. And I, I thought, like, I literally, like, I listened to, I, I believe, I listened to other podcasts and they didn't mention that. I believe that maybe one mentioned that or whatever, other ones that I listened to. But it was crazy. Like, no one mentioned that. Like, that shit was, like, kind of actually pretty cool. I like that. He drops down, just literally just drops. And it's like, Seamus is looking like, okay, you know, whatever. So he tries to pick him up. He pin, tries to pin him. And then, you know, he gets, like, the two count. And then once he gets up, uh, Seamus tries to bro kick him. He moves out the way. And then he ends up bro kicking she, um, Seamus. And which basically... Uh, Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose do their finisher on him and they secure the victory and they are still tag team champions uh, the next match was the fatal five way between Nia Jax yeah, I think, yeah Nia Jax I'm tweaking I don't know why I'm thinking you know Nia Jax uh, Nia Jax Emma Bailey Sasha Banks and uh, Alessa Bliss oh, Alessa Alexa Bliss and so, uh, yeah, like, matter of fact, looking back, I, uh, how, how my predictions been so far? Uh, I said that the Miz was going to win. Uh, I said that Wyatt was going to win. I uh, totally bombed that. Dean Ambrose and, uh, Seth Rollins, I said they were going to win. Uh, this fade of five way. This one, I said that Bailey was going to win. This is all part of my predictions. I thought that Bailey was going to win. But, um, no. She did not win. She did not win. Uh, one of the high spots of it is that I love when Nia, when um, Nia does the Samoa drop to uh, Sasha Banks and Alexa Bliss. That was actually a pretty cool spot. And it, I like it because they haven't really been doing Nia Jax too well as far as handling her character. But that was one spot to show what type of monster she is. Even though they're trying to make her like a beautiful monster. It's like that. It just shows what type of monster she is to, you know, do something like that. It shows her strength. So I felt like that was actually a needed spot within the match. Uh, Emma and Bailey powerbomb Naya on the outside with the help of Sasha Banks and Alexa Bliss, basically like running and kicking her off of the uh, rope because, yeah, she was holding on. Naya Jax was holding on to the ropes. Uh, Emma and Bailey was. Had both legs and it was about to power bomb her, but they was just they couldn't take her off, and so it took Sasha and Alexa to kick her off, and then bam, she is the floor. And literally, I believe I don't know if it happened. I think maybe her knees hit, maybe her face or close to her face. I mean, she didn't have a Cesaro thing, but you know, she yeah, she felt kind of like a, she felt a little nasty. On the floor. She felt a little nasty. Uh, and um, yeah. So later on in the match. Nia Jax. She's back in. She ends up about to. Um, tries to run into Alexa I believe. And then uh, hits her shoulder up against the metal thing. That's behind the uh, turnbuckle. Or. What am I. Am I envisioning thing? I believe. Yeah. That's behind the turnbuckle. I'm tweaking. Uh, and so. Uh, Alexa Bliss takes advantage. She. Basically pushes Bailey into someone else. Uh, DDTs her. And she gets the win. Actually a pretty good match. Pretty, pretty good match. I liked it. Uh, the next match was Cena versus Reigns. Cena versus Reigns. This is one of the matches that I really was looking forward to. Because it's it's two big, two big names. Even though we all know. Anybody that thought that Cena was going to win. Y'all should go slap yourselves matter of fact go back in time and slap yourself as well 
you know. But if you thought that Cena was going to win, of course you were dead wrong because Cena is about to go shoot a thousand movies. So he's going to more than likely be out for some months. He's probably going to come back maybe around Royal Rumble time or something of that nature. But he has a lot on his plate that he's going to do. And that's in like now. That's the reason why he uh, did his like send off. But I'm going to get to that. Um, so my pick for this was that Roman Reigns was going to win, I believe. Yeah, Roman Reigns is going to win. It made sense of my mind and frame thinking, whatever. Because Cena's about to leave, so Reigns is the person that's going to have to take over, uh, no pun intended, the reins of, you know, being the head honcho in WWE. When they both got into the ring, we heard a chance of, you both suck. Which I felt was, like, pretty hilarious. Just really, really hilarious. Um, this call Cena to leave the ring and go up to the Tychotron, go up the ramp or whatever. And this was the beginning of the dislikes when it comes to this pay-per-view or just this match in particular. Why Cena would do that, that was a heel move. Cena is not a heel. Cena is a babyface to the fucking core. He couldn't be a heel if he wanted to. And he wants to. Uh, he walks up the ramp. And it doesn't make any sense. Because he. Weeks back. Was talking about how he was going to beat. Reigns. How he was going to do this. But yet. He walks away from the match. Why would you talk about. How No Mercy is going to be a cakewalk. And you down talk Roman. Talking about you going to do this. You going to beat him down. You going to win. Da, da, da. But yet at the same time. When the match starts, because people are saying you both suck, blah, 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 you walk out from the ring. I don't get that. And then not only that, I thought that, okay, he walking away from the ring just to bait Roman Reigns to come back. And he was going, Roman Reigns was going to try and hit him. And he was going to go back and hit Roman Reigns. And then the match was going to go. If that would have happened, then I would have been like, okay. Cena set this up, Cena was, you know, whatever. But that's not Cena's MO. A lot of times, Cena, he wants, if he's in a match, he's in a match. He's not going to trick somebody so that he can get the upper hand. So, that didn't happen. Cena walks up the ramp, talking about, like, he's listening to the people, blah, blah, and sincerely looked like he was about to just leave the match. And Roman Reigns comes up behind him and hits him, knocking him down, which, oh my gosh, this... It was a lot to hate about this match in the beginning. It was a lot. Uh, so they get back in there. And I believe Cena was taking it very light. Very light. I don't know if it's because he's shooting a movie. And he doesn't want to do too much stuff. To where he possibly could get injured. And it will jeopardize you know, the movies that he's about to be in. Maybe get pushed back or whatever. Maybe that is the reason why he took it so light. And what I mean by he taking it so light is like really nothing happened in the beginning of this match. Nothing of note besides the reason, besides the um, time where uh, Cena swings Reigns into the steel steps and then he picks him up about to swing him into the other one. But then Reigns reverses and hits Cena into that. Other than that, there, nothing really happened to this match. And it's like... It wasn't really Cena. Cena, like, no. Like, Reigns dominated this match as, like, as, like, the um, Braun Strowman dom dominated the match between him and Cena this past, uh, like, uh, well, last week. And I just did not get it. Why was he taking it so light? Like I said, maybe it's just because of the whole movie thing. He, he, had, he signed to a contract. I want to believe that he's already signed to the Bumblebee movie and other movies as well. And that, you know, he doesn't want to jeopardize it by getting injured. So that's the way I can gen I can justify it. But yeah, he took it so light. Like he literally seemed like he wasn't trying to do nothing. It seemed like every single hit that he got from Reigns was like a powerful hit. And he couldn't defend himself. And it just, it wasn't Cena. You know, it wasn't like how Cena is in regular matches. It really wasn't. And I'm just like, what the fuck? 
And I'm just like, uh, like this match was just kind of like going downhill for me. Uh, and it was just not believable. It really was not believable. He was selling hard. Like Cena was really selling it. But at the same time, it just wasn't believable. If you have to, if you're going to sell something, make it believable. This just wasn't believable. I don't think Reigns did that much to Cena in order to justify Cena not being able to really fight back. And then when you look at it, Cena hit the steel stairs. You can put that out there like, oh, he hit the steel stairs, so he still hurt from that. So did Reigns. Reigns hit the steel stairs too. And he's walking around like, man, ain't nothing happened to me. We got Super Cena on the ground freaking hurting. And it just doesn't make any sense. But in any case, that was my little rant. Uh, let's move on. Cena, he has a cocky heel persona. Like, this is what it was confusing. Like I said before, when he walked away out the ring, that was a heel move. And then the way Reigns basically just, you know, he just went forward, just started dominating from that point on. When he came up the ramp and he hit Cena and knocking them down and stuff. That really, that was kind of a heel spot that a heel would do that Cena did. And this, how Cena was doing the five knuckle shuffle, that was that was kind of similar. It brought me back to when um, him and The Rock had their match. How he was being cocky and stuff like that. And it's just, it's more kind of like a heel taunt because it's like he's cocky with it. He's like, yeah, five shuffle. Yeah, I'm about to go ahead and do this, this, and that. And it just, it, it really didn't didn't fit right he had a cocky persona and well a cocky heel persona and it was just he's a baby face so why but then after that the match did start to pick up i wasn't no longer disinterested in this match um cena does does he does a super aa off of the term off of the uh top rope and no pin no three count for John Cena on Reigns. Uh, after that, um, Reigns spears Cena through a table, which is one of the tables out there that Cena was actually about to put Reigns through. But he spears him through that. And the way Reigns landed on the back, well, landed on his head and kind of bending his neck, it was like, uh, I don't think he meant to do that. But, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, what else happened after that? Um, John Cena does the fourth AA and still no three count. It's like, wow, this is like the AA in a sense, I'm not going to say it's a protected move, but in 80% of the time it is a protected move, 80% of the time, unless it's in a big match. But when you get the AA put on you, that's it. Even though it's one of the dumbest finishing moves that I you would ever see. But I like to characterize, I like to characterize it in a catchy finisher. And by catchy finisher, what I mean is that when you're sitting here wrestling with your friends or you're wrestling with your little brother or something, you know, dads, I've done it. I even got video proof of it, you know, doing wrestling moves on your children. I mean, I wasn't like slamming them hard. He was on the bed or whatever. Anyway, but uh, yeah, you know, that's one of those moves that you could just pick somebody up and man, it's an easy move. Just kind of like the Stone Cold Stunner is a catchy move. Uh, RKO out of nowhere, of course, is like one of the most catchiest moves. You know, it's just, that's what I kind of like see it as. It's a catchy move. It's stupid as all hell, but it is a catchy move. So he does the fourth AA, no uh, pinfall, but yet um, Roman Reigns recovers. Uh, does a Superman punch and spears him for the win. Uh, this match was lackluster. Part of the match was just horrible, just bad. In the sense of just Cena. It, it was like he left Roman Reigns to carry it. Roman Reigns did decent, but it all it, it, it depends on both performers. And Cena just wasn't doing his part in the beginning, but towards the end. You know, it's just, you know, whatever, but, um, it was a, it was a, it was a match, put it like that. It was, it, the other matches before then was actually better, were actually better than this match. And this was like, basically one of the main events of tonight, and they just kind of like dropped the ball on it. So, I mean, it is whatever, uh, 
Super Cena loses to the Superman punch by Reigns. He gives uh, Reigns respect. He hugs him, whispers something in his ear, sweet nothings. And he leaves the match. Basically just, in a sense, I got it as, well, before I even say it, um, Reigns left the ring. And Cena was uh, sitting down in the corner, and he ended up getting up, and he basically had like a hero's uh, goodbye, in a sense, where he kind of stayed, listened to the crowd chant, you know, whatever they're going to chant, thank you, Cena, whatever, and then, you know, he had like a long exit. So, and we all know that he's going to just shoot movies. He's not retiring. What a lot of people were saying, like, oh, Cena's retiring. Oh, this is that. It's like, no, he's not retiring. What I got from it is that that's the passing of the torch. That's literally a symbolic of Cena saying that, like, it's your game now. I had it. I was the top dog. Now it's your turn. And then that was just kind of him releasing that that torch that's just that that burden of carrying wwe now don't get me wrong he's still gonna be a head person he's still gonna be a head person when he come in he's going to do main events like the rock like brock lesnar and stuff like that but when it comes down to it it's like i guess it's like it's rain's turn to take the reins pun intended of wwe of being the top guy and so that's basically what I got from it. It's just the relinquishing of the torch. He's not retiring. He's not done. He's going to do a few movies. He's going to come back more than likely by Royal Rumble. If not after Royal Rumble, going into WrestleMania. And then he's going to probably leave after Mania and just do that type of stuff. Maybe just come back for the big shows. And that's basically it. And so the next match was Enzo versus Neville for the Cruiserweight Championships. Now, when you heard my predictions, if you heard my prediction, my prediction for this match was that I thought Neville was going to retain because Enzo giving him the title, he it just it, it just seemed like a desperate move to get something interesting going in 205. And since Enzo is a figure to where people know who he is, he can talk, he's charismatic, he has a lot of catchphrases and stuff like that that really not a lot of people on 205 Live or shit, even on the main roster can have a lot of the stuff that he's doing. The only thing that Enzo is lacking is in-ring, like, skill, and in-ring presence. When he's in the ring, he's just a regular guy. He's not Enzo. He's just a regular guy. But this was pretty interesting. He comes out in the Beetle um, Juice suit. Which I heard that I guess he loves Beetlejuice, but still, no matter how much I love, I would love Beetlejuice. I would not freaking wear a Beetlejuice suit. It doesn't make any sense. But he um, made a couple jokes about Neville, talking about how ugly he is, talking about that he is the creation of Frodo and the Kiba Elf had a baby, and I felt that that was actually pretty funny. That was actually pretty funny. Um, so the match gets started. Um, one of the highs of the match that I like was uh the ddg i guess is what they call it i mean at first i thought the announcers i think i think uh i think it was corey grave that called it or michael cole but they had said the ddg and i'm like did, did he just mess up but then i thought about it that enzo always says that he's a certified g so thinking of it he didn't mess up the move is freaking called the ddg now there's probably been mentioned before but i've never noticed it but yeah i mean the ddg it's corny it's corny but you know i, I kind of oddly like it um but in any case uh so uh enzo wins enzo wins this match by grabbing the cruiserweight championship and playing like he was going to hit Neville with it, but then he was stopped by the referee, gave the belt to the ref referee as the referee was like giving it away, uh, basically giving it to somebody to take out the ring. He goes up to Neville and kicks him where the sun don't shine and pins him up for the win. So, uh, freaking Enzo is our new cruiserweight champion. And I want to see what they're going to do with this. I hope that they do what they did to Tozawa. I think that was what it is. Oh, I might think about another one. Oh, my gosh. I, man, 
they just have a lot of people that we don't care about, or at least I don't care about. But that's what happened with the last uh, time Neville lost the championship. He lost, he gained it like right back almost immediately. So I think that's maybe where they're going to go. If not, I don't know how they're going to swing Enzo retaining it unless he just constantly, you know, cheats every time. But it's it's whatever. I'm a little bit disappointed. I think they should have took it off of Neville with somebody else that's better. Maybe even Alexander Alexander uh, Kendrick or Kendrick Alexander. Oh my gosh, man. Anyway, uh, or Cedric. I'm I'm like wow. This is this is how much I watch 205, which I don't. This is how much I pay attention to the cruiserweights. So I, I say, like, if you had to give it to like uh, Cedric Alexander, I'd be like, okay, cool. He might not be as charismatic as like Enzo, but at least have Enzo win it in like a way to where it's like a triple threat or fatal four way or just a multi man match. But Enzo is our cruiserweight champion, and that's it until it's not. And then that brings us to the last and final match, which is the main event. That everyone has been waiting for. I don't know why they chose to blow it off. On no mercy. There should have been a SummerSlam match. But seeing how it was. Oh excuse me. I am tired. I got off of work. so And I came straight here and recorded this. So yeah. But in any case. So we have these two. Big guys, big guy. We got two big guys going against each other. This is, I ain't gonna say a dream match, but this is a match that I myself and a lot of people wanted to see. And it's Braun Strowman versus Brock Lesnar for the United, United States. Wow. The Universal Heavyweight Championship. I don't even know if that's how they pronounce it, but the Universal Heavyweight Championship. So, during the match, literally, you can say throughout the whole match, Braun Strowman dominated. They did a great job with making him a monster throughout this match. They did an awesome job with doing that. I thought that they was going to stop. That they probably was going to be evenly matched during this match. Because he was dominating weeks prior. But no. They had him dominate this whole match. They had him throw uh, Brock around. They had him do a choke slam to Brock. They had him just basically just tear Brock apart. He did several of the power slams on them uh, to no avail. Uh, yeah, and it was at one point in the match where uh, uh, Lesnar gets him up in a submission and kind of like hurts his arms and hurts his arm. And so I forgot what the submission was called. But in any case, you guys know if you don't look it up. Uh, but yeah, he basically hurts Strowman's arm and he, Strowman sells it. He sells the hell out of it. And it brings it to the end of the match. Which Brock wins with one F5. Not two, not three, not four. But one F5 to Braun Strowman. Which I thought was, it, it shouldn't have been that way. I'm not saying that like Braun Strowman should have won. I think it's I think it's a little bit too sh soon. And if you're gonna do that, do it at a major event. Like Braun Strowman is a big figure right now. I'm not gonna say like he's as big as John Cena or, or Roman Reigns, but at the same time, he's getting over. He's very over. So when if you're gonna switch the title, do it at a big pay per view. Do it at like a Survivor Series. Do it at like a Royal Rumble. Or, I mean, it don't even have to be at a WrestleMania. Do it at a Royal Rumble. If they do it then, like, I can wait. If they do that, a title change to Braun from whoever, if Brock's still holding it, maybe they're going to have a rematch then. Or if someone else wins it before hit, beforehand or whatever. If they do it where Braun Strowman wins it at the Royal Rumble, I'll be happy. I'll be happy. You know, that would be actually a pretty cool thing for them to do. But I just didn't like how it took one F5 to end it. Now, I know I've heard just like a lot of people were just tired of like, well, you know, it's a finisher for a reason. It finishes the match. That if you're doing like four, five, six, seven finishers and like they're kicking out, it's not really a finisher. Like it has no weight to it. 
So doing it one time to win the match, that should be the be all end all. But you gotta look at it. This is a freaking championship match. They're gonna be wanting to freaking you know want to win. So they're gonna be bringing out that extra effort to kick out to not you know lose because of this power move. But I mean I get it. But I just think that it should have been a lot more done to put down Strowman rather than just one F five. But Brock retains, uh, and more than likely gonna disappear for the next ten months <laughs> before he reprises again for a month and then disappears again. But yeah, so Brock Lesnar wins with an F five, and he gave uh, Strowman gave Brock a run for his money. He gave him an ass whooping. He dominated the match, even though he didn't win. He still, in a sense, won because he basically Brock Lesnar survived this he survived this and that's basically the end of the pay-per-view that is it and um this actually wasn't a bad pay-per-view it actually wasn't it actually was i'm dreading dreading to see what smackdown is going to do at their hell in the cell pay-per-view i am dreading because the whole gender mahal thing with shinsuke nakamura it's just, man, abysmal, the stuff that's happening on SmackDown. But it is what it is. Um, and I don't really have anything else more to say. I covered all the matches, all of my notes. Did that. You know, I ain't have a crazy amount of notes besides the ones on the scene in Reigns. Uh, out of all the matches, out of all the matches, I'll say the best match and the worst match. Huh. If I had to pick the best match and the worst match, I would say it's really no best match. It, it's, it's, it's more of the better matches out of the mat out of all the matches. The better matches, the one that really I was actually really looking forward to, was the Brock uh, Strowman match, and I would say below that would be the tag team match. That was actually pretty entertaining. It was actually pretty good. Not even just because of Cesaro lost the team, which that I know this bad, but say that put it up points. That that put it um the match up points, you know, and more of like an interesting look to see what's gonna happen. Is he gonna finish the match and stuff like that? But uh yeah, so um that would be at like a close second, then it would be a I don't even know if I could count Cena Reigns after that, you know. But in any case, the best one I say like uh the better match of the night was the Brock Strowman and that wasn't even like a five star match but that was the one that I was looking forward to uh, I had some gripes with it but in the end you know it ended the way I thought it was going to end yeah, more than likely how everybody else thought it was going to end but and then the worst match I would say I would say it was the Cena Reigns I ain't going to say the worst no you know what I would put I'll put right above right. I'll put the Cena Reigns match right above the Neville um, Neville Enzo match. Not saying that it was like the worst match because it really wasn't a horrible match. But it's like because of Cena and Reigns did just like they just went off the rails at the beginning and then just picked up. It's like if it would have kept that way, that probably would have been the worst match. But, you know, it it wasn't too bad. It was half bad and half good. But, yeah, so the best match or the better match of the night was the Strom with the was the Brock Strowman match. And then the worst match uh, or the least more my least favorite match. My least favorite match was the Enzo Neville match. And so that concludes this review, recap, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, you know, pay-per-view results, my review on the WWE Raw brand pay-per-view event or just special event because it's on the network. I mean, whatever. Uh, of No Mercy 2017. What did you guys think? I know I'm late putting this out, but I needed rest. I really did. Um, yeah, it's actually pretty decent. Uh, matter of fact, I didn't give it a rating. I didn't give it a rating. Uh, out of 10. Out of 10, I would give it a, I would give it a 7. 
I'll give it a seven. Maybe eight. Maybe. Let's go with seven and a half. Seven and a half out of ten. Uh, this wasn't a bad pay-per-view, nor wasn't a great pay-per-view. It was a good one. It was a good one. I didn't I didn't hate it. You know? So it is what it is. So that concludes my review. Like I said, uh for you know, no mercy, special event, pay-per-view event, whatever you want to call it. And um I'm gonna be doing more of this. I'm trying to like I'm trying to bust my ass to put out these videos. It's wrestling, I gotta pay attention to it now more than I was before. And um yeah, so this is out. This is the third edition of the Wrestling Corner on the Take One Podcast. I'm going to have the fourth edition out later on. That will recap the good and bad of Raw and SmackDown this week. Later on, I may start in- interpreting and corporating maybe some, I don't know, uh, global, I ain't going to say global force wrestling. I guess impact wrestling now. Whatever they want to call themselves. I may incorporate that. I don't know. We'll see. I I mean, fell off. I really have not been keeping up. I really have not. I've heard that it's decent, but it's just out of all the stuff that's been happening there. It's just I don't want to do it. I just don't really want to do it. But I'm gonna try it one week, maybe next week. Matter of fact, yeah, next week, not this week, but next week, I'll watch a episode of TNA or uh, Anthem Impact, uh, whatever. I'll watch a episode of Impact Wrestling and try to give you my best review on it the best way I can. Or, you know, I just do it in the good and bads as well. I just throw it in the good and bads. Uh, later on, as I pro- further progress this, if this ends up becoming its own podcast, I probably might end up covering NXT as well. I don't watch that, but I probably start, you know, doing that and just going from there and. I probably might end up doing a review on the past episodes of Lucha Underground as well. But this is later on once I started getting my foot in everything. So, uh, well, with this podcast, if if it ends up becoming its own thing, which I'm trying to get the kinks out. It's not going to come with the rebranding like next month, but it's going to maybe in November. Maybe I have things ready by then or maybe sometime before then. Who knows? But in any case, I'm going to end this podcast. It's going close to 50 minutes minutes um what did you guys think what would be the rating that you guys would get it i don't care we'll give it i don't care whether if it's out of 10 out of 100 if it's a b c whatever you want to give it a uh, five star out of five stars whatever i mean what did you guys think about it did you like it you love it hate it disliked it you thought it was okay the blah uh what did you think what did you think um Put it down there in the comment section below. Like this video. I believe that this went actually pretty good. This was actually a pretty good podcast. Uh, yeah, so go ahead. Hit the like button. Subscribe. Subscribe to my channel. The rebranding will be coming soon. But as of right now, I have a lot of stuff that I've been putting out the past couple weeks. Go check it out. The movie reviews, spoiler cast, other podcasts, quick takes and stuff like that. And I'm going to have a lot more. I have a new show review. I'm going to start doing much more of those. Uh, and some other stuff that I'm going to be doing. Music reviews and a whole bunch of stuff. The whole nine. But uh, yeah, so and turn on your notifications. Everything else is in the description from social media and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, that concludes it. So I will catch you guys on the next Take One podcast. As well as like if you're just wrestling fans and you listen to this, I will catch you on later on this week on the fourth edition of the wrestling corner portion of the take one podcast this weekend so we're going to be discussing like i said the good and bad about raw and sat down i'm just repeating myself so i'll catch you guys later peace